All right, guys. No Time to Die's release date is just around the corner. Yes, it's been pushed back, and from what I've seen of the trailer, it looks to be promising. But that being said, since No Time to Die is a direct sequel to Spectre, I re-watched the 24th Bond film in preparation to see number 25. I originally saw Spectre in theaters when it came out back in 2015, and I was just as thrilled seeing Daniel Craig on the big screen in this movie as I was when I watched him in Casino Royale back in December of 2006. Spectre is presented in a singularly haunting way that, were it not a Bond film, would have me questioning the realities that our main protagonist experiences. But I've come here not to review the film, but rather a specific part of it, the firearms. They're major plot points in some of our favorite movies, but they're sometimes overlooked. Welcome to Firearms and Film, a series where we'll take a look at the firearms in some of our favorite movies and the roles that they play. It's part education, part film review, part commentary. From westerns to science fiction, this is a retrospective of film that I hope you enjoy. Here are the top five firearms for Spectre. Perhaps more iconic and recognizable than the tuxedos and the martinis is Bond's pistol of choice. Ever since Dr. No, the Walther PPK has been his go-to weapon. If there's a gun everyone recognizes, it's this one. But the original author of the Bond books, Ian Fleming, was very close to having Bond always carry a Beretta 418. Admit it, the lines of the sleeker, more compact Walther fit the Bond character tons better. After being dropped in favor of the Walther P99 by Pierce Brosnan in 1997's Tomorrow Never Dies, it's picked back up again by Craig in Casino Royale and has been his main sidearm ever since. It was the unfortunate weapon of choice for Mr. White's suicide whenever Bond offered Mr. White his PPK as a token of trust, but it came in handy for Madeline Swan, Mr. White's daughter, whom Bond has sworn to protect, as she comes blazing into the cargo car just as Mr. Hanks is about to put Bond to sleep. Forever. First marketed in the 1950s for undercover police officers in Germany, the Walther PPK is manufactured still to this day, chambered in a variety of rounds from 22 caliber to 32 ACP and even 380. In the original film, Dr. No, the gun actually uses a Walther PP, the PPK's bigger brother. But every subsequent Bond film has utilized the genuine article. Most people speculate that Bond's PPK is chambered in 32 ACP, but regardless of the ammunition, it's a robust design using a straight blowback system to achieve cycling. Bond makes few misses with his Walther PPK, except for matters of plot convenience. Inspector hitting a helicopter in a critical area while bobbing down a river at night on a speeding boat from a distance of more than 200 yards has got to be one of the trickiest trick shots ever performed. It seems as though the gun used is not a blank firing one as it doesn't appear as though the slide moves nor the hammer falls. No shell can be seen ejecting. This means that the muzzle flash is either CGI, which is more than likely, or some kind of flash paper gun. Flash paper and CGI are often used to augment prop guns in movies where set conditions do not allow a blank firing gun to be used. In this instance, it probably has to do with the direction of the wind blowing as Bond discharges his firearm, as any spent brass would more than likely strike the actor in the face. As a rule, exotic locations require exotic looking firearms. It's in the swelter of the streets of Mexico City that we find Bond as the film opens. Tracking his mark through a Dia de Muertos parade with a lovely masked Morena, 007 ducks into a hotel and makes his way upstairs into a hotel room. Things get hotter as the pair prepare to have a little Day of the Dead celebration of their own. As usual though, work comes before pleasure and Bond's got business to take care of, much to the Senorita's chagrin. Deploying a wicked looking carbine, he strolls nonchalantly out onto the roof and takes up a sniping position across from his target. Utilizing some kind of future tech homing microphone, he listens in, and it's at this point that the discerning eye might be able to see something familiar in Bond's weapon of choice. It's none other than a Glock 17 glommed on with a few extra parts to convert it into a carbine. Swapping the blade sights for aperture ones, the Glock in question is hardly discernible beneath all that hardware. But in spite of its highly customized, one-off appearance, the carbine conversion kit is actually a thing. Unlike carbine conversions of yore, this kit actually gives the user the ability to charge and chamber the weapon with its own handle in the back. The barrel is unaltered, but it is shrouded, and a foregrip is added for extra stability. This is most certainly an ideal compact weapon for a spy, 
and with a 33 round box magazine gives the user plenty of ammunition for suppressive fire. Fiendish in appearance but more familiar to us than we might realize at first glance, the Glock 17 with its Fab Defense KPOS furniture is nifty and neat. And while the 9mm round it's chambered in isn't exactly a sniping round, it's got plenty of knockdown for what Bond's got in mind. This is what happens whenever you carry a proof of concept fever dream to fruition. Perhaps one of the most iconic bad guy guns of the Daniel Craig era is the Siamese twinned Italian made Arsenal AF 2011 Prismatic, seen here being used by Mr. Hinks. Now, as a man who gouges eyes and snaps necks at the drop of a hat, this seems a fitting firearm for Mr. Hinks. Ruthless and full of dogged determination, Mr. Hinks tracks down Madeline Swan just as Bond reaches her. The gun he carries is an amalgamation of two Colt style 1911s, each with their own barrel and firing pin, but sharing triggers, hammers, sights, and frames. Notice how much wider the pistol grip is compared to a standard Colt 1911. That's because each barrel is fed by its own magazine for a total of two magazines held together by a shared base plate. Finished in stainless steel, this one really stands out, and it's a shame what little screen time the Arsenal AF 2011 was given. The kick of one Colt chambered in 45 ACP isn't as terrible as one might think, but to have a two for one will more than likely rattle the teeth of most shooters. After all, you're getting double the bang per trigger pull. A bullet from a 45 ACP round is generally about 230 grains. Assuming a muzzle velocity of 960 feet per second, this translates to about 470 foot pounds of energy. Double that, and you can easily see why a man like Mr. Hanks would probably prefer it. I'd expect nothing less from a man who murders in cold blood just to prove a point. So, two takeaways for future Bond movie henchmen. If you're going to make a name for yourself, gouge eyes and carry a big gun. Okay everyone, we're down to the last quarter of the film. Shooting bad guys at impossible ranges is as much a part of Bond as Aston Martin. Spirited away by an antique 1948 Rolls Royce to a surreal oasis in the middle of the desert, Bond is confronted by his long-term adversary, Blofeld, in Blofeld's top secret lair. The formalities of the foes are short-lived, however, as Blofeld proceeds to strap Bond into a chair and drill into his skull. Bond, with the help of Madeline, makes his escape by means of his signature explosive timepiece. After making their way outside, Bond grabs an assault rifle from a guard, then commences to fire it with uncanny 007 accuracy. The assault rifle at first glance might be mistaken as an AK-47 chopped down or even a Type 56, but in fact, other than its outward appearance, it bears little mechanical similitude to either. This gun is actually a Czech-made VZ-58 chambered in the ever-ubiquitous 7.62 by 39mm rifle cartridge. Developed to replace the VZ-52 light machine gun, the rifle was accepted into military usage in the 1950s. Bond's rifle is the compact version with a shorter 7.5 inch barrel and folding stock. You can see him deploy the folding stock as he takes a long shot at one of the bad guys by the helicopter. Everybody knows that Bond movies have always been about firsts. From genre tropes and cliches to awesome one-liners, Bond movies have set trends and inspired other awesome, I'm looking at you true lies, and not so awesome action movies. From Connery to Craig, producers, screenwriters, and directors have all aimed to put their own unique twists on all the Bond iterations. Sometimes this manifests itself in the methods of killing for some of the villains. They're always on my mind, Xenia on the top. And sometimes it manifests itself in more subtle ways, like showcasing the cutting edge of a new product. Heckler & Cook's VP9 hadn't been out a half a year and it was already making its debut in Spectre. While at a distant glance it may appear to be just another generic polymer frame clone, it actually isn't. Tucked away in its frame is a refined striker fired system that Heckler & Cook have perfected since the first P model handguns rolled out in the 80s. Its variability in configuration is touted as one of its foremost assets. The grip is customizable and yields more than 27 different combinations for maximizing shooter comfort. Chambered in 9mm, maybe this was the gun that Craig should have been showing to Madeline on the train. I'm just kidding. I do love you, 6R226. 